is insubordinate, stubborn, unpredictable. You need the god of mischief. Unbelievable, wherever you go, it's just death, destruction, the literal ends of worlds. No change. Is that possible? You can change. I am Loki, and I am burdened with glorious purpose. Change. Hello, and welcome to the first, the preview episode of Still Watching Loki. I'm Vanity Fair senior writer Joanna Robinson. And I'm Vanity Fair special correspondent Anthony Bresnikan. We are back, Anthony, back in the uh, Marvelverse. You know, it hardly seems like we left. It was just a <laughs> short time ago, but it is nice to be back. You know, those fallow periods in between shows, uh, I miss you. Oh, I miss you too. <laughs> I'm so excited that we're doing this little preview episode. Um, obviously, we are we are doing this in advance of the premiere of Loki, which will drop next week. Um, and going forward, we're, we're doing Loki a, just a smidge differently. Then we did the last two Marvel series, WandaVision and Falcon and Winter Soldier. Um, previously, Anthony, if you might recall, we would desperately wake up at the wee hours of the morning on a Friday and try to crash a, a podcast together, right? Do you remember that? Fate I memories do. That? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have happy uh, memories. That's not such a bad thing. But uh... Uh, Yeah, I'm giving us all a little bit of a break this time. So episodes of Loki will drop at midnight Tuesday Pacific time. So, uh, you know, folks can either watch it then if they're, you know, maniacs or wake up on Wednesday, watch it anytime during the day on Wednesday, the Wednesday evening, Loki Wednesdays are a whole thing on social media now, etc. We will have this episode for you on a Thursday. So you mm-hmm. will get this from us on a Thursday, Thursday morning, early, something like that. I don't know. We're just giving ourselves a little bit more breathing room. And that way, what's great about that uh, is that the podcast can be a little bit more interactive in that you guys can email us as you always have but you can email us about the episode we're discussing still watching pod at gmail.com uh so that is our new plan anthony any comments questions or concerned about the new plan i have no concerns but i think uh you know we're trying to give people a chance to watch it and actually absorb our conversation about it once the majority or a large group of folks at least have a chance to sit down and watch it i know the diehards are there at midnight uh you know, to, to check out each Marvel in, <laughs> chapter. But, uh, you know, some people take a little longer the next day to catch up. And so we'll be there for you uh, to discuss this uh, after you guys get through it. All right. So uh, please do take advantage of the email. We love getting your emails. Still watching pod at gmail.com. We got a couple email questions about, you know, for this preview episode about what to prepare for, for the show. So we're going to do some basic prep right now anthony and i and obviously sorry when loki kicks off in earnest when episode one drops next week our colleague richard Lawson will be back uh in his role uh chatting with me the first half of the episode so richard's just taking a a little mayor of east town break <laughs> this week but he'll be back he'll be back with us next week uh so anthony and i are going to do some sort of basic bare bones breakdown of of what you know what loki is what to expect Then we have a great interview, and I say great because of him, not because of the interviewer who was me, but a great interview. Oh, come on. You're you're a great interviewer. You do great conversations. I'll hype you. I'm your your hype man. (laughs) Thank you. Um, With the show head writer, Loki head writer, Michael Waldron. And we'll get into into it in a second, why why Michael is especially uh, exciting to talk to right now in in the realm of big franchises but uh he had some great really interesting stuff to say they got me extra excited for a show i was already excited for so that will come in the middle of the episode and then uh bresnikin and i are gonna get a little a little extra nerdy a little granular like we like to maybe a little forward looking about how loki's gonna affect everything so uh you know if you if you want that you can stick around after the interview for that does that sound good anthony bresnikin sounds good to me all right. Uh, do we want to st- let's start with uh, who are the main creative forces uh, behind Loki? What do you know, Anthony? Well, we have uh, the writer, Michael Waldron, and it's directed by Kate Heron. I think it's interesting. They have the they, they tend to pair a writer, like a showrunner and a director. So these are kind of like mini movies rather than TV shows where they hand uh, back and forth 
different, um, you know, different, different directors. And, you know, I know there's a writer's room, but the, but I like the, the sort of singularity of vision that they, as much as any Marvel movie is, <laughs> that they bring to these shows. Uh, is Kate Heron sticking with every episode? She is. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. So that's like before. Yeah. So I know Kate's work from the great show Sex Education, a great Netflix series um, mm-hmm. that folks should check out. Um, and yeah, I think it's interesting also, not only on each of these shows have we gotten a head writer, they don't, they're not really calling them showrunners. And my, and Mike Waldron in our interview kind of got into the difference between a, a regular showrunner and what Marvel's calling sort of their head writer position, right? And Adam B. Very, by the way, has an excellent piece on, um, on variety about sort of the idea of these Marvel shows not having a showrunner per se. Oh, that like My ODW that, like... colleague, Adam Berry. <laughs> I like him. He does good work. Adam's great. Yeah, this idea that they have a head writer and a director for these first three shows, WandaVision, Falcon, Winter Soldier, and Loki, and they've been al- alternating. WandaVision had a female head writer and a male director for all the series. Uh, Falcon, Winter Soldier had a male head writer, female director for all the episodes. Um, and this is another male head writer, female director for all the episodes. So I just like that they're sort of doing that kind of pairing. Um, whether consciously or not, I like it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, so that's Kate. I'm really excited for Kate. Uh, we'll be talking to her later in the season. But Michael Waldron is uh, a Rick and Morty writer and also created the show Heels at debuting on Stars. It's about pro wrestling. You'll hear him talk about that. Um, but also, what do you know about Michael Waldron going forward? In the world of of Disney, Anthony, mm, I don't know. You tell me. I'm 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 drawing a blank. Okay, so <laughs> Waldron Waldron got hired to do this uh, show. Then, um, before Loki was even done, I know he got hired... in a different a different universe we're going into as well. Well, right? that's why Is that I said what you're Disney. alluding to. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was very Marvel and Doctor Strange. Okay, so you fill it. Up. Where are we going first with Marvel and Doctor right, Strange? Right. So he's doing Doctor Strange. He's he's he was tapped to. You know, once um, they decide to not go with uh, the writer and director of the first Doctor Strange film, Marvel tapped Sam Raimi to direct and Michael Waldron to write Doctor Strange 2 uh, in the Multiverse of Madness, Mm -hmm. which we talked about a lot when we talked about WandaVision. So he wrote that. So he hopped directly from Loki. Loki wasn't even done yet. (laughs) He hopped directly from Loki to working on that. And then... Feige was so impressed with everything that he's done on Loki and on Doctor Strange. That then what did Kevin Feige do? Anthony Bresnikan. Oh, Kevin Feige took some money and went to make a Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> he's developing a Star Wars show or Star Wars movie. I, yeah. I believe that's the current status of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, Michael Waldron was liked so much. He got invited to play with those toys. So he's going to be writing on that film. Uh, so that, that's the Waldron, the, the rapid ascension of Michael Waldron, which is why he's such an interesting person. Um, also just like a really nice guy and, and, and really smart about story, a great person to talk to. So we have him on the show. We're really excited about that. Um, he was a writer's assistant on community. I believe he was, he was. Uh, which the Russo brothers were deeply involved with. So he's got connections to them. Of yeah. They- they left, went from, everybody graduated from that community college and went on to big things. Uh, you know, they went on I don't, to yeah. Avengers. And... I don't think you overlapped with the Russos at, at community. I think they were ships in the night, but. Um, uh, were they? I will say, so we've got, so this, this is dropping uh, at the same time that I've got like a big profile of Michael Waldron that's going to be on VF.com. Uh, I talked to Dan Harmon about the fact that like uh, Kevin Feige keeps plundering the Harmon treasure chest, right? Took the Russos, uh, took Waldron when they were just about to make uh, Waldron the the showrunner for Rick and Morty. They plucked mm-hmm. Waldron out of there. They took Jeff Loveness, who is another Rick and Morty writer, and he's writing the new Ant Man film. So, like, uh, and when I talked to Kevin Feige, he said he was a big Rick and Morty fan. So I think he's just sort of peeking over the fence at Harmon Town, seeing who he can pluck. And I asked Dan Harmon, I was like, would you fight Kevin Feige? in the street for all the people that he's taking. He's like, well, I would, except Kevin Feige's so nice. He would just be like, oh, I think it's great you're fighting me. That's great. I think this is awesome. So he's like, what's the point? Uh, so yeah, so I talked to Harmon uh, and Jeff Loveness about Waldron and sort of his his big rise here. So that's over on uh, VF.com right now as you listen to this podcast. So that's, I mean, I'm already excited. <laughs> we haven't even gotten good into the show itself. I mean, it's a sign of things. A nice pro- Loki is a nice prologue of things to come. Yeah, exactly. Um, something that Nate Moore said um, when we talked to him for Falcon and the Winter Soldier, one of Marvel's longtime producers, 
was that WandaVision, Falcon and the Witch Soldier, and Loki were the first three shows that they brought to 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 Bob Iger at Disney when they were saying, like, we want to launch Disney Plus and these are our first three pitches. And they were sort of surprised that their first three pitches got the green light. But I think the thing that Nate Moore said at the time was like, well, if you've seen Tom Hiddleston at Comic-Con, you know that it's like irresistible to build a show around him. Brez, were you at that Comic-Con when Tom Hiddleston took the stage as Loki? Oh, I was. So there's like a strobe effect and then he comes out in costume. Yes. And essentially recreates his scene from the first Avengers where he makes what's that basically like wants to rule over a group of people. You know, when he stands in front of that crowd and is like, kneel and they all kneel except for one man. So he kind of came out and, and uh, trash talked the audience. It was very WWE if I'm being honest. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he was the heel and now he's the hero of this story, or at least the protagonist. Uh, possibly we'll see we'll see we'll see um and then the last thing i'm gonna say sort of like big bones premise of this is that uh we asked michael waldron the my favorite question to ask these these uh head writers like what's the one comic book recommendation that you would give to someone uh before mm. they dive into your show this paid off really well for us with falcon the winter soldier right because malcolm spellman recommended the truth which was the isaiah bradley mm-hmm. comic and that wound up being one of our favorite parts of the show was the Isaiah yeah. Bradley stuff. Red, right? white, and black. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so journey into mystery by Kieran Gillen, not to be confused with Karen Gillen. Uh, Kieran is K I E R O N Gillen G I L L E N journey to mystery is a hard thing to sort of narrow down, but the run we're looking at suspicious mm-hmm. specifically here is six, two, two to six, three, six. And it is about kid Loki. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, dug into this comic uh before we started anthony did you get a chance to look at it yet i did yeah and it's yeah. i think you know the the comics never are, are a one-to-one correlation right. with the movies but you can kind of see this uh it's like a post ragnarok type of story if you think of it that way asgard has been destroyed loki has been destroyed but he exists in these other forms and uh those other forms are kind of falling back into familiar patterns i guess we'd say yep i mean we'll uh, the kid loki is interesting and and there may or may not be a literally a kid loki in this series we're going to talk about that in a second but um you'll hear from waldron about like why that comic was interesting to him but like as you say it's never a one-to-one right but it's more like what is the essence of this comic that has interested these writers, right? They didn't do the truth, red, white, and black comic for Falcon Winter Soldier, but the story of Isaiah Bradley was interesting to them. So like, what is it about kid Loki? And like I said, you'll hear Waldron talk about it, but I really enjoyed reading this comic. Once you get used to the like Thor font that they use in all the <laughs> Thor comics. Um, it's <laughs> you'll a weird a good one. Time. <laughs> it starts off with a lot of bursting creatures too, which I think is like, okay, once you can get through that, then you're in, in a good place. But I, I mean, fun. Yeah. What, I, what, what, what struck me about it is it's, it's like about it's about a character who's struggling to be good, like struggling to be different. Like, how much can you actually change? <clears throat> and, right. and I know this is a divisive movie, but it reminded me a little bit of Joker, uh, the Todd Phillips film with Joaquin Phoenix, in that mm. there's a character you kind of empathize with, but then kind of don't. And then... Re- it's a it's a story that's really pushing you away from the central figure uh, as they push away from their better instincts. You know, there's a scene early on where the specter of the deceased Loki arises after right. a series of riddles are are uh, are are solved and tells kid Loki, like, I did I, I, I did all this. I allowed myself to succumb in order. The only the only person I would do that for is myself. So. I think it's kind of like a, again, not to draw another franchise into this, but like a Darth Vader, like, join me and we will rule the galaxy. Like, I, you are me, I am you, we are all together, cuckoo <laughs> right? Like, uh-huh. it's, um, and I find that compelling. Anytime the <clears throat> the protagonist is like, you have a destiny, and that destiny isn't necessarily one that you want, but it is in you. And I think all people carry that with them. Like, we carry... Um, good and bad potential within us. 
And so that internal struggle feels to me like what they're exploring here. Because also, Loki did die in the Avengers movies. And this Loki, I think it's worth pointing out, is like offshoot Loki. It's not Loki Prime. Loki Prime died. This is a Loki that saw his chance and in one of the little time variations, grabbed the Tesseract and, um, you know, blipped out into another time and place. And so now he's been corralled by uh, this sort of supernatural agency that manages disruptions in time in order to keep everything from collapsing. And so, you know, the long arm of that law is reaching out to grab it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great point. We should, we should point out uh, an underline that this Loki is the Loki right after the Battle of New York, right after having lost the Battle of New York, right? Uh, in Avengers. That's when he skipped out, which means this is a Loki who has not lost his mother, Freya. This is a Loki who has not built up his relationship with his brother. Uh, you know, this is a less evolved Loki. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's it's kind of a fun thing to do. That's a soft reboot on a character who has, I think the phrase Waldron used was arced out. Right, like has made his emotional development. Now we get to reboot and go back to like, uh, you know, a less mature Loki, uh, possibly more fun Loki, if that's if that's your flavor of fun. Um, so so that's where we are are setting up here. Let's go to that agency that grabs Loki. So this this uh, this world that we're in, that we're launching off of. If you've seen any of the trailers, you will see it. Uh, is the TVA. Uh, Anthony Bresigan, what can you tell me about the TVA? I mean, we don't really fully know. We know what, what's what been shown in the promotions, but, uh, you know, we have an understanding ourselves that this group is, they're kind of like the FBI, but they're not in our timeline. They're not in any timeline. They're these sort of uh, watchers. They're in their own dimension outside of it, uh, you know, and that they were created as a sort of retroactive way of fixing disruptions in the, I guess you'd call it the time-space continuum. Um, you know, it's uh, it's a little bit of a high concept, but, you know, whenever you're dealing with time travel, that's how it goes. Uh, what else do you think people should know in advance? Like I do that. I, I, I think unpacking it as part of the show is kind of the fun. So I don't want to spoil it too much for people, but what else do you think is, is necessary? Sure. If, uh, you know, a fun thing that um, if you if you look, watch the trailers, there's a lot, it looks like it's both beautiful, like in a sort of 1960s kind of sci-fi way. And uh, like very, uh, you know, uh, tedious bureaucracy at the same time, um, and I think they've said in other reviews that they were inspired by the DMV to uh, yeah. to create the TVA. Right? It's, uh, it's very so bureaucratic. Little, it's not. It's not yeah, magical. Yeah. It's a bureaucracy. A lot, a lot of, of lines paperwork. and paperwork and stuff yeah. like that. Uh, but you've got a couple different uh, levels of authority here. Uh, so so we could just yeah we don't have to get too much into it. But I will say that like from what I know from the comics, um, I, we should say I haven't seen any of Loki yet. Right? So. I'm not spoiling anything, but like from what I know from the comics, um, like a punishment, you know, if, if the if the TVA sees a branch of time, something that is too wildly outside the realm of acceptable branching of time. And we learn in Avengers Endgame that like the timeline can branch. Right. Um, if they see something that's just too chaotic, too out of, is going to just screw everything up, they might delete a person. Or delete a timeline. That's something that they can do. So they can blip you or your entire timeline out of existence. Right? So that might be something that they're threatening Loki with, possibly. I don't know. Um, the, they're like time gardeners in a way. Like, they can just prune it back. <laughs> yes. Yes. I love that. Um, we've got three levels of authority here. We've got at least, right? We've got judges. Um, and, and let's go into the casting a little bit, right? So we've got ju the judges. Uh, and Gugu Mbatha Ra is playing one of the judges named Ravona Renslayer, who we will come back to in sort of the minutia section. But that is the, the judges. That's We've a very got Harry Potter yeah. sounding name, don't you think? <laughs> she would be yes. a, she would be in Raven's Claw with the name. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. Rowena Ravenclaw, Ravana Renslayer. I got you. Uh, we've got Owen Wilson, of course, here. He's an administrator playing Mr. Mobius M. Mobius. 
Can we um, pause on that name now, or do you yeah. want to get to that later? Yeah, it's so Go Mobius for it. again. These are these are how would you describe them? Like mystical beings, supernatural beings in some way. I think um, in the comics, a lot of them are clones. To be honest with you, but I, I don't I don't know what we're dealing with in this uh, version here. Yeah, but they're not human per se, not, right? Yeah, I would say they're, no. There's something else, and uh, Mobius. Anybody who's taken a strip of paper, twisted it, and then connected the ends knows that at that point you have a two-dimensional object that only has one, or a three-dimensional object that only has one side, which is weird. Like, you can trace the edge and you just keep going in a loop. So Mobius Strip is that little schoolyard craft. Uh, and so there's a bit of, like, infinity implied in the name. He's, he's, uh, he's an infinite, infinite type being, I guess <laughs> Yeah, and we've seen this, uh, the Mobius concept in the MCU recently um, in Endgame when Tony Stark is trying to crack time travel. He he figures it out by using an inverted uh, Mobius strip uh, mm -hmm. is his Endgame time travel approach. So there's that. And last but certainly not least, we've got the time monitors who are sort of like the, you know, the the physical enforcers of, of this agency. Uh, Wunmi Masaku is one of them. She's fantastic. She was so good in Lovecraft Country. Uh, she's been in a million things. She got a BAFTA nomination this last year for this film, His House. So I'm so excited uh, she's here. I love His House. Yeah. Please watch she's that on Netflix if you like a scary movie. She's great. <laughs> she's so good. And then the great Sasha Lane uh, is another time monitor. And they just have their names are like B15 and C20. They don't have like. Uh, fun Harry Potter names, but those are that's the TVA as far as we know right now. Mm -hmm. Um, are you ready to get into some other casting, <laughs> Anthony yeah. Rustican? Yes, of course. Ready? For, right. to, I'm ready to go wherever you, you want to go in our timeline until we get deleted. <laughs> here, here comes what's really interesting about Loki. Um, I believe that what we will be watching is Loki hopping into various of these uh these various branching timelines and meeting up with other loki so mm, that explains uh, the kid loki aspect of the right. comic and, so uh, we're pretty sure there's a kid loki we're pretty sure there's a lady loki who's also from the comics so can so lady loki is another incarnation of this right. trickster god mm -hmm. how does he have all these incarnations do we need to I think it's a that? it's an Asgardian thing that they they sort of like it, that's what Ragnarok is. This is a sort of like you die and then like everything re re blooms. Yeah. Odin is forever sort of regenerating. <laughs> it's sort of, sort of like Doctor Who. You regenerate, uh, and I think usually you re, uh, you know so this similar is a mixture spirits, of Norse lore and Marvel lore. But yeah, go ahead. Similar spirits, same memories, or do they start over again? I mean, let's see. Based on the comic we were reading, the Kid Loki in that comic. He doesn't have the same memories. He doesn't know what's up. So it's almost like a clone in a way, right? Like yeah, you're a clone. But it's the almost same, like, like, spirit almost? Same. It's, well, it's like the same nature versus nurture thing. Like if mm. you take two twins mm. and you separate them and they're raised differently, you know, you, there are all those stories about how, like, well, the separated twins, like they both became firefighters and they both married somebody who looks the same, you know, or they have, like, all of these weird, like, synchronicities in their lives so it seems like like if you were to create a clone of yourself and then have somebody else raise her she wouldn't grow up just like you mm -hmm. but but she would grow up with the same sort of dispositions as you right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that's what we're dealing with i think right at, at least i'm trying to wrap my mind around it, possibly I and i think that refraction of of uh what did you say? Disposition, right? That mm -hmm. refraction of disposition, that refraction of identity across a kid Loki, a lady Loki. And I won't, I won't talk necessarily about the casting of those characters because those are still question marks. I'll just say there's probably an older Loki and we do know that Richard E. Grant is in this show. And wouldn't Richard E. Grant be perfect for an older Tom Hiddleston character? You know what right? it, it kind of reminds me of is like, you know, when they're casting a role and they're like, I would like this type. You know, yeah, <laughs> it's like, bring me the, you know, the poor man's Brad Pitt <laughs> or like bring me under budget Brad Pitt or bring me, yeah. you know, that they're just they're types, right? They're personality types where this actor reminds me of this other actor. And you see it like when people start to break out, everybody goes, oh, you're the next dot, right. dot, dot. Um, and I kind of feel like 
you know, Richard Grant and Tom Hiddleston, like they're just, they're in the same casting file, but just separated by a generation, I guess you'd say. Uh huh. Yeah, I love that. I, I completely agree. Mm-hmm. So I love this idea. And, and this is sort of what Walden, Walden will talk about in this interview where it's like, the idea of this show and, and to him of television in general, he, he names Mad Men as one of his favorite shows, right? And so this idea that like Mad Men is about Don Draper um, kind of figuring out who he is over the course of Mad Men, that doesn't necessarily mean he's going to change who he is, but that knowing is sort of a satisfying journey for a character. Um uh, a, a more sort of genre sci-fi friendly version of this. So this is a Waldron quote. He says, in the case of Marty McFly, where he can encounter the younger version of his parents who are his age, and that helps him understand them better. And then he understands himself better, right? That's mm-hmm. back in the future, right? So this is like, okay, what if Loki gets to do that, but it's literally himself in different branching realities? And what if one of them's, you know, a kid, one of them's older, and one of them's Lady Loki, and probably... One or two of them will be played by Tom Hiddleston himself, you know, we get double mm-hmm. Hiddleston. So that I believe is, you know, what sends him hopping through the the branches we, we can get into a little later. But like that, I think, is is the joy is the absolute jewel box of a treat that's in store for us. Of course, from a Rick and Morty writer, because it's a classic Rick and Morty. There's like this <laughs> there's this episode of Rick and Morty called Council of Ricks, right, where Rick is tasked by Council of Ricks. Like, the only way he can save himself is to go track down a worse version of himself that's hopping through time and space. You know what I mean? That's an episode of Rick and Morty. So, like, are we going to get a council of Lokis, essentially? You know what I mean? Like, Loki has to find the worst version of himself somewhere in time and and stop them. And that's the serve. Oh, only a Loki can catch a Loki sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? I think that's what we're going to see. So, I'm excited. Anything else you want to talk about, sort of, like, big picture before we get into this interview? Hmm. Well, let's see. I think Hiddleston, we should talk about Hiddleston a little bit, what he's brought to this role. Like, it's a character who's gone back and forth in our sympathies. <laughs> you know, you mm-hmm. you loathe him, you fear him, you like him. He's so charming. And he occasionally has been helpful, but usually goes back to being trouble. You know, he's not like a Snape type character where he seems bad, but then really deep down, heart of gold. He, deep down, I don't know what Loki is. Um, Definitely not a good person, but he's somebody who's struggling and also feels things, feels pain, is, you know, motivated by his feelings of being an outsider. Um a really interesting character, and I think Hiddleston brought a lot of dimension to him. Absolutely. Don't you think? There's a lot of complexity to this character, especially, like, in his relationship with Thor, with Chris Hemsworth's Thor. Um, That brother relationship's one of my favorites in the MCU. And I think this idea of allowing Tom Hiddleston this playground in which to not only play one Loki, but many many different flavors of loki i mean yes please give that to me i want it so um so yeah i, I think i think that's also uh, one of the inspirations for the show is is hiddleston's versatility and his complexity right um that he can play great drama and snarky comedy within a hair's breadth you know while and, and- while wearing that uh crazy helmet with the- <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what those tusks are. They look like mammoth tusks or something. Like I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, the Loki horns. Um. All right. Well, let us hear from. I will. I will stop spoiling our own interview with with Michael Waldron. Let's hear from Waldron himself on on his Loki plans. His his doctor. He talks about Doctor Strange. He talks a little bit of Star Wars. Like we got it all. It's all here. Uh, So let's take a look. Still watching is brought to you by Happy Dance Premium CBD Skincare from Kristen Bell. Whether you've tried CBD products before or you're already a huge fan, Happy Dance is different. Actress, mom, and do-it-aller Kristen Bell co-created Happy Dance to help everyone make the soothing benefits of CBD skincare a part of their daily routine. So, what does Happy Dance feel like, Joanna? 
Well, it's like rubbing a sense of it's going to be okay right into your skin. It's like a secret door to your happy place. Happy Dance products are made with only the highest quality CBD and premium ingredients. If they wouldn't use it on their own mothers, they wouldn't put it in Happy Dance. They've got whipped CBD body butter, an ultra calming CBD bath bomb, and a multi-purpose CBD coconut melt. They sent us all three of these products and I have been like slathering and <laughs> bath bombing ever since. I just keep them at my desk and sometimes I just sort of... Uh, yeah, it, it, there's like a, it's, it, there's a little bit of like a cooling sensation than just that classic calming sensation you get from the CBD, uh, situation. And something I will say as someone who has tried various CBD products, um, the quality of the lotion itself or the, you know, the whipped body butter itself or the coconut milk itself is really good. Sometimes you get CBD in like not so great packages and this is just like it's got everything all combined what do you think Richard yeah it's not just about the CBD it's the whole product the holistic Mm -hmm. item Um, I you know like many other people became something of a cave monster the last year and so I use particularly the uh, CBD coconut melt from Happy Dance and it's like it does I mean it sounds I, I, I mean it how it sounds. It makes my skin feel relaxed, which makes me feel relaxed and soothed. And um, it's just a really nice product to use. Um, yeah, like you said, sort of throughout the day or in situations like mine where, you know, I was out enjoying uh, the outside for the first time in a long time. So right now, still watching listeners get 15% off their first Happy Dance order. But only when you go to doahappydance.com slash still watching. That's 15% off your first order of Happy Dance CBD skincare at doahappydance.com slash still watching. This episode is brought to you in part by Third Love. Listen, I need to tell you about this new bra that I found and why I love it. It is Third Love. They are designed for your perfect fit. They use the measurements of millions of women to design bras with all day comfort and support. They stand behind their products. And if you don't love it, exchanges and returns are free for 60 days. Every Third Love bra is made with signature memory foam cups, no slip straps, and a scratch-free band from cups AA to I, including half cups and bands like 30 and 48. There's this thing that third love does they've got this fitting room quiz which is just an incredible way to find your perfect fit without having to have an awkward encounter with uh, someone in a dressing room somewhere it's like a personal shopper for you the fitting room quiz focuses on size shape current fit issues and your personal style to deliver bras and underwear that are perfect for you throughout the whole thing the fit stylists are available for one-on-one chats to answer any questions Listen, it's time to break up with your bad bra and fall in love with better bras and underwear. Your boobs deserve it. Third Love is changing the game when it comes to comfort and style for all your everyday essentials, from loungewear and wireless styles to their number one rated 24-7 classic t-shirt bra. They're creating the ultimate shopping experience. Third Love also donates all of their gently used return bras to women in need, supporting charities in their local San Francisco Bay Area and across the United States. So far, Third Love has donated over $40 million in bras. Their love knows your one true fit is out there. So right now they're offering our listeners 20% off their first order. So go to thirdlove.com slash still watching now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 20% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash still watching for 20% off today. Hi, quick note from uh, Joanna here before we get to the interview with Michael Waldron. I just want to say that this conversation was taped over two different days. So if it seems like I'm circling back to something we already talked about uh, a little bit, like why do you ask about Loki here and then again later? Uh, That's because it was a second sort of installment of the conversation. Um, Also, at one point, uh, Michael Waldron's very adorable dog came in. And uh, so if you hear some snuffling, uh, that is the dog, not Waldron or myself. So please do enjoy this uh, conversation with Michael Waldron. I've talked to Kevin Feige before, and something that a lot of people don't realize about him is that he's not, he was not a comic book geek growing up, right? He loved movies. He didn't love comics. Um, so I'm curious for you, what did you love growing up that made you want to get into screenwriting? I loved pro wrestling. That was that was what I loved. That, mm-hmm. that was like, that was my, that was like the first serialized storytelling that on TV and, and that I was drawn to in like the nineties, there wasn't, 
everything was so procedural. And I remember as a kid watching like Power Rangers and stuff, you know, it would drive me crazy. They'd have these big battles and everything. And then the next week, uh, it's like, well, that didn't even happen. And it, and it drove me crazy. But so I think what I loved about wrestling, even as a kid, was there were stakes. Uh, if, if, you know, Hulk Hogan turned bad uh, one week, that had big ramifications for the rest of my life, as far as I was concerned. <laughs> um, and so that, I think that's why I was so drawn to it. Tell me about your adventures uh, through the Blacklist. That was, so I had, after Community, I had, um, I created a show about wrestling. I created Heels um, in 2017, or, or, and in 2017, that got picked up by stars, picked up to a writer's room, which I ran. And we wrote the first season, and then we couldn't cast it. Uh, and so the show didn't get made. And I was like, well, so much for my meteoric rise. My career's over. Uh, well, <laughs> I, guess, I, guess, I, guess, I guess this is it for me. I'm like 29, like uh, re- really, really languishing. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I was like, you know, I came out here wanting to write Marvel movies and wanting to write Star Wars and, and that stuff. And and. I asked my reps, I was like, how do I, you know, I created a, a TV show about wrestling. How come I'm not on the Marvel (laughs) list? And they're like, cause you haven't written a movie. Uh, you, you, you know, you need to, you need to basically write a, a feature sample. Um, and so I, I kind of licked my wounds after that, after that show, after heels went on the shelf and said, all right, let me, let me, proved to myself that I can still write. And, and that was when I wrote worst guy of all time, um, which I wrote really fast. I, I, I basically, I just wrote a draft in like two weeks and then spent a few months just revising it and everything. And, and that was, you know, af- after a year of uh, grinding it out on like a premium cable drama uh, <laughs> with like, with like serious, themes and everything it was fun to just write something with you know that was a comedy with a lot of romance I love I I think I I would be happy just being Nora Ephron uh, (laughs) is the is the truth Uh and so this this was my my sci-fi uh attempt attempt at that and so that you know I I wrote that script and it it was a blast and I I kept I, I went on to Rick and Morty that year 2018 I worked on season four um and then it, it wound up on the blacklist and that, that was an amazing, you know, th- those guys are so, so great what they do. It was like, it was like really cool just kind of like going through that whole process, um, meeting all the other different writers. You know, when I, when I went into pitch on Loki, I think the first thing Kevin Feige said to me was congratulations on the blacklist. And I was like, oh shit. <laughs> that was, oh no I'm glad, glad i got on that thing and so tell me about that first marvel meeting how did you get it how did you get in that room I, you know i i had heard that marvel was was doing a loki tv show about mm-hmm. time travel i i had just written this stupid little time travel movie and i you know and i knew that was was hopefully a good enough sample to to get me in the room and so that you know that's that's what got me that first meeting with uh Stephen Broussard and Kevin Wright, who were the two primary producers and executives on, on the project. And I came in and I was honest with them. You know, I think like Kevin Feige, I, I'm not a, a massive comics nerd. Right. Uh, you know, I grew up again, a pro wrestling guy, probably more of a star Wars guy. Uh-huh. Um, but my love of Marvel came from the movies. I knew even then before I'd ever worked with them, how good of an actor Tom Hiddleston was Mm -hmm. like, you know, all right, suddenly just the ceiling for the show felt so high to me. Here's this blockbuster movie villain who's known around the world and so beloved. And we're going to get to do six episodes with him. Like, like, like you're going to get to do what great television does, which is 
deconstruct that character in a more intimate, um, quiet, occasionally digressive way. It's like my favorite shows, Mad Men, The Leftovers, stuff like that. Like, like getting to do that with Loki. Yeah. I, I just said to them, I was like, guys, I, I, I think this should be the best show ever made. Like that, <laughs> like that, that was my pitch was like, you know, what if the Loki show was simply the best show anybody's ever seen? Not a bad pitch. Yeah. I'm curious. Um, uh, you know, I've talked to, I've actually talked to some other people who pitched on, on Loki and I talked to Jack about her process and, and I know that, uh, for WandaVision. And so I know that going in, you go in and you get some, a basic structure of what they want the show to be. They already have an idea of what they want the show to be. And then you've got to hang some meat on those bones. So what can you say about sort of the, the meat that you put on the bones of, of the idea that they had? Yeah. I mean, they, they had, they had the world that, that was the bit which, you know, to their credit was such a brilliant creative choice on their own that came from Kevin Feige, Kevin Wright, Stephen Broussard to put Loki in the world of the TVA. And so that, that was the sandbox uh, that we had to play on. And I think, what I came up with was the, the emotional engine of the, of the whole thing. You know, this is a character that's, there's been 10 years of movies with this guy. Like he's mm-hmm. lived and died uh, many times. In mm-hmm. fact, how, how do we make sure we're not just doing the same thing we've seen before? Uh, how, how do we break new ground with this character? And, and so it was just figuring out that emotional core. What was I going to rip off? Uh, in each episode <laughs> that, that was what what great better movies and tv shows did i intend to rip off can you tell us some of those better movies and tv shows you ripped off oh man i mean so <laughs> so many blade runner for sure mad men before sunrise or sunrise all sorts of inspirations catch me if you can another big one um let me ask the really nerdy question then which is i know you're not a comics guy necessarily but obviously if you're going to write the loki show you have to read the loki comics so oh. Um, if you could recommend one Loki comic for folks to read to get, you know, prepared for the show, what would you say? The kid Loki comic, it was one that I was, I was really drawn to that I, that I just thought, thought was very cool. It's the journey into mystery, but it's Loki dies and is reborn as a, as a child. Um, and and it's his journey and it and it's it's inspirational not necessarily because our our show is about a child version of loki but because it investigates and esca- uh, excavates um his humanity uh in a in a more vulnerable you know a way that you only can with a with a child a child version of loki is so still so burdened by the by the sins of his past self and everything which is very much i think what our version of loki is running up against in in the tva you know he's he's just look this is who you are this is who you've always been uh of a villain can can a tiger change its stripes i want to ask you a process question which is you know having even though heels didn't go having you know gone through the process of running a show there's a difference between a uh you know your standard showrunner and the marvel head writer position those are two different things and i was wondering if you could sort of delineate what those differences are yeah i mean i you know i think the simple thing is that a regular showrunner like on heels you start out you run the writers room and then as things proceed in production you kind of stay the chief decision maker uh you know in on set um three basically fulfill the role that a director does in a feature Mm -hmm. where you're the final say on set in post and everything it's you're the author of that of that thing and the marvel side it's it works differently but i think has worked really well at least in our case where I came in, I was the creator and the head writer, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and 
and me and our writing staff, you know, we, we were, we were the first department on is how I like to think of it. <laughs> uh, and, and we got to start running the race, um, you know, and, and it's lay the foundation for my vision of what that story would be in conjunction with what, you know, Marvel wanted. Um, and then Kate Heron came on board as our director and that was amazing because Kate's a great creator uh, and artist and filmmaker herself. And so suddenly we had the benefit of fresh eyes mm-hmm. on this whole thing. Um, and so then, you know, in the process of uh, revising and everything, we had all of her input as we, as we hurtled into production <laughs> and all of that, uh, you know, I, I would say that it, it's been run more like a feature in Mm. that, you know, it's a probably more director driven. I mean, just by, I'm I'm not, I'm not the showrunner in the sense that I'm not the one with the budget hanging over my head. Uh, (laughs) Well, let's say something like if there needs to be a rewrite uh, of, of something for whatever reason, what's the process behind that? Are you, have you handed things over completely at that point or? No, that's, that's still, that's still me or, mm-hmm. or in the, in, in our case, um, I wasn't on set because I moved over to Dr. Strange yeah. as I was getting ready to go to Atlanta for Loki. Uh, Kevin called me and, and said, Hey, uh, <laughs> there's, there's something else. Uh, and, and that was just, we were fortunate as we, we, we'd worked really hard and we'd gotten Loki into a really good place. Um, And so my my, kind of my number two, Eric Mark was the writer who was on set there. Okay. And he, you know, it was a collaboration between him and me. Uh, If there was stuff getting rewritten on the day, that was usually him, you know, his fingerprints are all over the thing as well. Uh, And he did amazing work. I got to be the author of the whole thing. Kate got to go make it. And, and, you know, it's worked really, really well. It's also, frankly, there's some freedom in it because, you know, show running, seeing something all the way through is an all encompassing job. I have mm-hmm. had the benefit of, I was able to go do Dr. Strange. Let's talk about that Dr. Strange call that you got <laughs> and and what that was like and what you were tasked, you know, obviously like Strange had already been worked on by other writers, et cetera. So what was that process of bringing you on? That was, uh, I was leaving Owen Wilson's house, which is already a <laughs> Like surreal. you do, right? <laughs> because, because we'd met, because he was getting ready to go to Atlanta. So was I. Uh, and so already I'm free. I'm like, oh my God, uh, it's Owen Wilson. <laughs> uh, and Kevin called me and, you know, let me know that, that they were, going in a different direction on Dr. Strange. Um, and they wanted to bring me on and I, and I was, you know, I was thrilled. Like I'd loved working on Loki. I knew I wanted to stay in the family. I felt like Loki was in a great place. And I, I even then was kind of like, you know, I, I was eager for maybe what the next challenge would be. Uh, I, I like starting in on something new. Yeah. Um, and so at the time, I think that was February of last year, 2020, the movie was going to go into production in May. Uh, I, I came on um, and then Sam Raimi came on board about a week later. So suddenly I'm working with a hero of mine. Right. Uh, literally, you know, one of the reasons I'm probably a writer uh, is his movies. Um, and it was basically, you know, it's kind of like, all right, at first, how do we, how do we just make a movie in two months? Uh, but COVID quickly descended upon us. Right. The one thing that afforded was the opportunity to, to just start from scratch on Dr. Strange. And, and Sam and I were able to kind of dig in um, and just, you know, s- start over on something that, that we were both really excited about, uh, and, and kind of make it our, make it our own. Um, 
the, the work that Scott had done uh, establishing that world certainly is, is all over the place and is already there. Uh, but just Sam and I had time. And I was like, all right, well, we're not shooting now until November. What do right. we want this movie to be? Right. Um, and so that, you know, I, I got to spend my, uh, my 2020 on Zooms with Sam Raimi. Not uh, bad. Not bad. Yeah, not, not too bad. Uh, and so then, you know, we figured that out and I, and I wrote, wrote that movie. And then that's what I was, I went over, I was there all of last November, came back for the holidays and then was in London January until April 18th shooting Dr. Strange. Here, here's a question I think that um, is interesting for you to be on the ground floor of, which is this idea of the changing relationship between the Marvel TV and the Marvel film. Um, because, you know, Kevin, Kevin gave that interview recently where he was like, oh yeah, Strange was supposed to show up at the end of WandaVision. And we decided that that was not the direction that we wanted to go in. But when something like that happens, how does it ripple over into your film, a decision like that on the, on the TV side? This was Kevin's attitude from our very earliest conversations on Loki was these TV shows are going to be just as vital to the ongoing story of the MCU as the movies and just as consequential Mm -hmm. and everything. So it was, it wasn't, it was like, but at the same time, characters that were going to cameo in one movie end up not cameoing all the time. Like, so, so it's like, it was, it was more just like, okay, Dr. Strange didn't show up in the tag of that. You know, it it, it wasn't the fact that it was T that WandaVision was TV for him not showing up in a TV show versus him not showing up in a movie didn't really affect things one or one way or another. It was more just like, yeah, you just, you roll with the punches. The story is always sort of shifting. We knew, um, I had the benefit of, I, w- I got to be pretty good friends with Jack Schaefer because we were, yeah, she is the best. And her and I went to, went out to dinner early on in in the process i think their writer's room was like four weeks ahead of us and uh we just became great pals and i and i really admired her so much and all the work she was doing and so when i got brought on to dr strange you know it's i i really especially because wanda's part of that story i just wanted to make sure i wasn't gonna let my friend down (laughs) because i you know (laughs) that And she like, teed it up for you and you're like, no, let me, yeah, let me I was yeah. like, I, yeah, I was like, I can't shit the bed. Uh, she did, she did such a great <laughs> job. Right. Um, I, I can't come in and, and blow this thing. So, so we, we had a lot of conversations. It, you just, these things are always changing. And so w- whether or not one character shows up at the end of something or not, uh, I think our minds as the writers we know to never hang anything on just that thing happening because okay. for all you know, it might change. Yeah. Oh, I'm interested about this sort of like growing. Um, I don't know if you want to call it like community of, of Marvel writers that hasn't really been the case in, in previously in the MCU, but like your friendship with Jack, I know that Je- your friend Jeff's working on Ant-Man, you know, stuff like that. So is there sort of like this, feeling that there's this growing little class of Marvel writers that are able to talk to each other, bounce ideas off each other, that sort of thing. It's certainly great because we are working in a shared universe. Again, we all, the charge is always make your thing the best thing. Yeah. And then, and then figure, figure it out. But Jeff Loveness, who's writing the new Ant-Man is one of my closest friends because we worked together on Rick and Morty and just became great pals. Right. And so, uh, he's dealing with the quantum realm and I clearly was dealing with time travel and the multiverse. So of course, uh, our conversations are, uh, probably illegal to have, uh, <laughs> digitally. Um, we, we have to, we have to meet 
um, in a, on a bridge somewhere. Right. Trench coats. Uh, at midnight. Yeah, 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 exactly. And it's, and it's great. And like, and, and Bisha Ali, who was one of my writers on Loki, uh, was the creator of Miss Marvel. And, and like I said, having Eric, uh, on, on Loki being there on set and Jack and, and, and just having, having all those friendships, I think to the extent that it can feel like a, like a family, it, it helps us all because it's just, you know, it's easy for me to, to text and say, Hey, what are you doing with so-and-so I'm thinking about this. Yeah. We can make sure we're not messing things up too bad for one another. Although (laughs) part of it, part of that is the fun is, is, you know, creating a disaster and just saying, yeah, we'll leave that for the next writers. <laughs> but then, but then you do that on Loki and you find yourself writing Dr. Strange uh, <laughs> and, you, and you have to clean up your own mess. Oh, so. another nice mess I've gotten myself into. Um, awesome. Yeah. Can you, what at all can you tell me about Dr. Strange? I mean, I can, I can tell you that it, that it is a, it's a ride. It is a, it is a thrilling uh, very Sam Raimi. Um, I mean, S- Sam is a, is an absolute genius. I think, I think the movie is incredibly visually thrilling, uh, between Sam and everything that he does. John Matheson, our DP who shot Gladiator and Logan. Like, I just think the look of it yeah. is going to be unlike anything you've seen in the MCU before. Um, and I think it's, you know, Benedict is amazing as, as that character. And, and I really tried, you know, I, I really loved writing. And I mean, you know, he's, he's Indiana Jones to, to me, you know, he's, he's Indiana, Indiana Jones to you. In, That's in, interesting. In a, in a, in a cape uh, <laughs> and, and, or in a cloak. I, I, right. he, I, Dr. Strange would not be happy. What I love about Dr. Strange is, is he's a hero who can take a punch. Those, those are, you know, that, that, that's what made those Harrison Ford heroes so great. Uh, Han Solo and Indy, John McClane, those guys get their asses kicked. Look at Stephen Strange in the first movie. He, he's, he's really, you know, he's getting beat up, but he's very capable and everything. Yeah. And I think that's what, what's great about Benedict. He's such a good actor. I've been so lucky to get to work with Tom, then to get to work with Benedict. Yeah. And then also Lizzie Olson. I mean, is like, you know, it, I don't know if there's anyone better working today. Uh, getting to continue Wanda's story was amazing. And so, yeah, look, it's scary. It's fun. It's thrilling. <laughs> it's, uh, it, I, it's a great ride. What? If anything, can you tell me about Star Wars? Oh, the Star Wars. You know, uh, it's it's a thing. It's a real thing. I'm excited. It's it's still very, very early days. Like I said, I've been just focused on Doctor Strange. I'm excited to keep working with Kevin. I'm also really excited to work with Lucasfilm. You've heard all my references here. Uh, <laughs> Star Wars, Indiana Jones, I, I Kathy Kennedy, she, she's made so many of my favorite movies. So to get to collaborate with both of those entities is a dream come true. Um, and I'm excited to see what that becomes. Um, I want to go back to Loki and ask you something that's been interesting hearing Jack talk about WandaVision and Malcolm talk about Falcon Winter Soldier is with Falcon Winter Soldier, they were they kept pushing this line about it's a six hour movie. And Jack's like, I'm definitely making television. So between those two sort of binaries, where would you plop Loki? Um, it's, it's something, I, I guess I'd say it's something totally new. It's, it's MCU. It, it's, it's MCU uh, done uh, hour by hour, weekly, episodically. It, you know, I, I never wanted it to feel feel like it was necessarily just one big movie because Mm -hmm. that's I think sometimes when episodes themselves just feel like just feel like chapters 
then it start it's it's like they don't necessarily stand alone and yeah it was really important to me that every episode stood alone as its own thing um and that that if you sat down and maybe just watched one episode of the Loki series mm-hmm. uh you could still get swept up and and really enjoy it um so it's certainly you know so yeah i don't know it 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 felt like we were again i go back to something like the leftovers or like watchmen Mm -hmm. um which i admired so much but it's like every one of those episodes felt like such a distinct short story as -hmm. opposed to a chapter and that that's that's a philosophy that i've tried to execute do you feel like there are going to be the episodes where you can sort of, where someone can describe it and say the, this episode, the Mad Men episode or the whatever episode sort of thing? I hope so. I hope so. If anything, that was kind of how I, how I pitched it. I, I, I went in and I had a pretty clear vision for each episode. It, it yeah. was inspirations and everything because, because I did want every episode to like I said stand alone and feel different from the last I I want the audience to have a different experience every every week yeah probably probably something I I carried from Rick and Morty right you know which can run a little bit procedural not that this is procedural at all but it's like I wanted to accelerate things to the point where each week it felt like oh shit wait, now we're, now we're doing something. Now we're doing that. Now we're doing this. And and so that was fun. It's so easy to describe a Rick and Morty episode, right? To someone, you can just drop one word and they're like, they know exactly which episode you're talking about. Exactly. Exactly. And I think yeah. that's a, yeah, that that's the sign of a great episode of TV when it's like, oh, it's that one. It's that yeah. episode of Loki. So I hope, I hope you can identify our episodes by that or by their respective uh, gifs, gifs, whatever. whatever oh, uh, you're re- you're ready for the memes. You're excited. yeah. That's that's, <laughs> a, that's what I told Kevin in my pitch. I said, I, I you know what? I'm going to give you a lot of iconic gifs. Oh, I mean, so, uh, what more could the show ask for? That's uh, what the fans want. If if Baby Yoda has taught us anything, it's that gifs can definitely <laughs> sell a television show. Um, all right, so. You mentioned two Demon Lindelof Love shows back to back. Is is Demon a, a big influence for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm certainly a huge fan of his. I, I mean, Lost. I watched Lost in college. That that was like, you know, what a phenomenon that was. The, mm-hmm. the constant is maybe the best episode of television ever. And I, but I think The Leftovers is. You know, Matt, I guess Mad Men's my favorite show. I think The Leftovers is just behind it. I, I think The Leftovers is astounding. And and it's, I just, I loved especially the episodes that tended to digress that would, you know, follow Matt on the boat, on the yes. ferry or yeah. something, or, or Nora at the conference. Yeah, I, I admire The Leftovers so much. I love that show. Dan Harmon must also be a big influence for you. Can you talk about like what you learned from Dan? Dan's great. I mean, Dan, you know, he's you're lucky when when somebody that you just admire as a as a writer as a, as a mentor becomes becomes a dear friend. Uh, Dan is just first and foremost like a a great dude, you know, and and just like a the kind of guy who will let the writer's PA sit in the room and pitch jokes and ideas and not uh not look down on you and not make you feel stupid but but embrace that and and help you know and it, and it's it's like you know he, he just he ran such a democratic room when i worked with him in, in the sense that just just always the best idea won i mean dan is a notorious perfectionist uh you know and, and it's so it can always be better to him. Um, that is, he, he's, I, I would say he's, he's probably rarely satisfied. So am I, uh, <laughs> I'm always the least happy with everything, uh, I'm, I'm doing, but to me, that's, that means that we're doing it right. Yeah. Um, there, there was, a, there was something that I, I heard from Bob Murawski, who's the editor on Dr. Strange too, that he, 
learned from Orson Welles, which is you, you must be the enemy of the film. Uh, and that's, I feel like Harmon does a great job, job of that in a way of just like the enemy of the script in the sense that like, can this scene be better? Can this joke be better? Can, the, can this emotional execution be stronger too? And then just practically, he's just great at accelerated storytelling. You know, I mean, it, it's beyond just the pure story structure that he's known for mm-hmm. um, with, with the story circle and the hero's journey and all that. It's just, you know, look at Rick and Morty. We blow through four sci-fi concepts in an episode that frankly, I'd be sitting going, shit, why did I pitch that? I should have just written a spec. Based <laughs> on that. I had this one sci-fi idea that I could have probably went and sold. And now it's just the first quadrant of this episode. And Rick right. ends up making fun of it within seven minutes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and it's like, but it's, that's the confidence that it's like, well, you're going to come up with a better idea on the heels of that. And yeah. so, you know, that's what I learned from Dan. Do you feel like uh, Loki runs at a, a similar pace? Um I mean, the Rick and Morty pace is breakneck, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, if, <laughs> if, if anything, there was an initial, at first in the writers, I, I was carrying in the Rick and Morty sensibility, and I had to, like, recalibrate and be like, okay, wait, I'm not writing a 22-minute cartoon. Right, right. Uh, that is insane. <laughs> uh, and so we, is so no, so not, you You can't, you can't, you, you have to slow down, and 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 when I say accelerated, I don't mean that you're blowing through scenes quickly. Mm-hmm. Loki, in fact, I like, I looked at, you know, I was watching Tarantino movies and Glorious Bastards and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, movies that, that tend to really luxuriate in these long scenes of dialogue and tension building. Yeah. Um, when I, I think the acceleration is just like, the way the story is hopefully propulsive from one uh, episode to another and and just how much ground we're able to cover in in Loki's journey. Uh, Something that was really fun talking to Malcolm and Jack was uh, them describing, physically describing sort of some of the stuff in their writer's room. And obviously like, I don't want you to give away any spoilers, but (laughs) you know, Malcolm told me that they printed out, Killmonger speech from Black Panther and and posted that up in their writer's room. So is there anything sort of spoiler free that you can say to describe? The yeah, I can show you what, what was all over our writer's room. <laughs> okay. And it was drawings like this of timelines. <laughs> Time branches. Brand, and it was somebody draws one and then a writer comes up and says, no, no, it's not bad. It's this. And it, and it <laughs> And it was, there was so much, uh, because like I said, we had to, we had to create time travel is what it felt like. We had, we had to file, you know, create an in- institutional knowledge of how time travel would work within the time variance authority. Yeah. And that was just the baseline. And then from there it was, okay, how can we now tell a story? So the audience never has to think about this. So the yeah. audience gets it. And then never thinks about it again. Um, and so it was a lot of drawings of um, of squiggly timelines. <laughs> and I mean, yeah, Endgame does its best to try to present uh, rules of time travel in a way that is digestible for an audience and will ask them to not ask too many questions later on. But like then, of course, the audience is asking questions like, what happens when Steve goes back on his own timeline or what, what happens, you know, this sort of thing. And, and is any of this, not, I wouldn't say like cleaning up the mess, but hoping to like further refine and define that idea of time travel that's introduced in Endgame. Yeah. I mean, look, those, those guys laid the foundation, which I was glad for. It was mm-hmm. like, they, they, okay, here's some base rules yeah. of what they're able to do. How, how does time work? in the way that the the Avengers understand it, right. at least. Um, but like you said, they had the luxury of it's a three-hour movie. Right. At the end of it, you get to walk out. And, and it's like, you're going to talk about the time travel and everything, but you're not, it's not going to sit with you and probably ruin your experience of the movie. 
I was always very acutely aware of the fact that there's a week between each of our episodes and these fans are going to do exactly what I would do, Mm -hmm. which is pick this shit apart if it doesn't make sense. Yeah. And so, you know, I, my charge to our writers and and they more than rose to the the task uh, was to, to create a time travel logic that hopefully was so airtight that it could sustain over six hours. That was the thing. A time travel show is harder than a movie because in a movie you can just say, well, who cares? It's time travel. I know it's kind of bullshit. I, we, we had to, we had to make sure that a lot of this stuff lined up and and that it, that was hard, but it was fun. And there's some, there's some time travel sci-fi concepts within there that I was like, I, I'm eager for my Rick and Morty colleagues to see, <laughs> to be like, Hey, look at, look at what we came up with. Yeah. I know Kevin is a huge fan of, I think the legend is that he missed his prom because he was in line for back to the future too or something like that um he's a big you know back to the future fan did you talk at all like what did you talk about in terms of what is the narrative advantage of a time travel story what do you get out for your characters narratively i mean it's fun it's fun as hell but like you know emotionally I mean, I think we we talked about it as a as a chance to, you know, you can literally hold up a mirror to your characters in in many different ways. You know, perhaps they can encounter other versions of themselves at different points in their lives. In the case of Marty McFly, he can encounter younger version, you know, versions of his parents who are his age, who helps him understand yeah. them better, and then he understands himself better. Um, so I think it was, you know, a character as complex as low. I think everybody would agree this is a complex character mm-hmm. that, that what, what he's got going on is, you know, is, is pretty intense up there. And, and he's he's always he's dealing with a lot. And so it was a it was a show that was always going to require some real self-reflection because isn't that what that to me, that's what great television is like a great a great movie is about going through a transformative experience that mm-hmm. that fundamentally maybe changes the way you act the way you the way you behave yeah. the best tv to me like mad men is about characters becoming aware of who they are and maybe why they are the way they are. Don, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that Don Draper necessarily changes uh, too much. I mean, may, maybe you know, maybe after he made that Coke commercial, he he wasn't miserable anymore. But yeah, maybe but he, maybe Esalon changed him. Yoga on the side <laughs> right, changed him. Right, maybe. Right, but but I think he gained an awareness of who yeah. he was, of how he was broken, of why. And I think that's that's an interesting thing that the television does, and it, it's holding up that that mirror. And so, uh, time travel, you know, for a million different reasons, gives you a lot of cool science fictiony ways to do that. And I don't expect you to get into the specifics of this, but fans of the Loki comics know that there is like there is a kid Loki, there is a lady Loki, there is a sort of thing. So this idea of meeting yourself along your travels could be literalized in a Loki story. It certainly could. It could uh, be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it, it, it could be. And, you know, it's like, what, what being is more chaotic than Loki? What do you, you know, what, what, what do you have to learn from, from any version of yourself? Uh, is, is there anything to learn or, mm-hmm. or, or, or you know, th- those are those are all the interesting questions to to ask with a character like this. Let me hop over to Strange for a little bit, if that's okay. I think you compared him to Deanna Jones the last time we talked. Um, but it's interesting. I was talking to some of the people who wrote the first film, and something that they said their issue with uh, str- or their challenge with Strange that they felt was that um, that he was that the Tony Stark that we've known in the MCU is kind of cribbed from Dr. Strange's character in the comics that they kind of put a lot of strange in their Tony Stark. 
So then what are you going to do? Just have another Tony Stark? And their answer seemed to be kind of yes. And we see that a bit in in Infinity War when Strange and and Tony are sparking off each other. And and that version of Strange, I like the first movie. I really love Strange and Infinity War. I think that's an even better opportunity for Benedict to do what he does. How do you think of of the way in which the MCU is figuring out how to use Stephen Strange? I always I always thought of I mean yeah cer- certainly there there's the I mean it, yeah that conflict comes to you know he and Tony feel like different sides of the same coin in Infinity War in a really cool way narcissistic uh sarcastic clever heroes who you know still are able to save the day uh with with a grin um I, I, when I first started writing Strange, I was, I think I told you, I was like, like with Loki, I was like, who, who is the, what's, what's like a touchstone for this character? And I landed on Steve Jobs. So I'm fascinated by Steve Jobs. All right. They're both, they're both adopted. They're both, you know, and, and I'm just like, not that Steve Jobs is a villain, but he was a guy who sought control. Yeah. In his life in the way that I thought Loki did. And with, with, Doctor Strange, I kind of, I actually gravitated toward Anthony Bourdain, weirdly. I, Interesting. I was like, I was, I, and I like listened to Kitchen Confidential, just to like get in that voice, because it's the thing about uh, Tony, Anthony Bourdain was, was, he's very educated, very sophisticated in the way Stephen is. It's, yeah. it's like, it's like Tony was very much, Tony Stark was very much like, man of the people you know like hey i'm just one of the guys like strange is uh an elitist yeah like a- as a neurosurgeon um and even as a sorcerer and so but and and it's like you know anthony bourdain is a is a man of the people but there is that like there's just that intense intellect with mm-hmm. him um, and you always feel like he could eviscerate anybody with his words at any time, but yeah. yet, and this is something my, my assistant Alana pointed out that Anthony Bourdain never really punches down, yeah. you know, and, it, and it's like, that was a, that was a interesting thing. And, and so it's like that, that was maybe the first ingredient in the stew for Dr. Strange. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. And, and then it's like, you know, he's an adventurer. That, that's probably where the where the you know the Indiana Jones stuff yeah. comes from. It is it's why why do you why do you have to be the best surgeon? Why do you have to be the best sorcerer? What mm-hmm. do you why do you why do you have to go halfway around the world chasing you know ghosts? Like yeah. what are you what are you looking for? Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, and and that's that stuff's interesting to me, and and I think that stuff's interesting to Benedict, and so so yeah, he's just he's a he's a cool he's just a cool hero. I loved writing him. Given that Stephen is a is a person who can open up a portal and step into another country in a second, or um you know uh, another multiverse, if that's what you know your story is about, um then you're thinking about world travelers, right? You're thinking about who's who's someone who's curious enough to to hop around the globe like that. Yeah, yeah, ex- exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, it, it, yeah, and and that's back to the the Anthony Bourdain thing. Been mm-hmm. been, been everywhere, seen everything. You know, like like what what surprises you at this point? That's an interesting thing, I think, for all of the heroes in the MCU in a post in game world. Mm-hmm. Like, think about what they've encountered and what they. Right what they fought how how do you how do you rally yourself to to fight the standalone movie villains after you fought thanos yep. that's an inter- that's an interesting yeah thing. and i mean that's the you know looking at something like um i mean the the post end game mcu has been so interesting in that so much of it, it seems to be about um mourning something right you know wanda is about mourning vision Falcon Winter Soldier is, is in its own way about mourning Steve or, you know, not that he's dead, but the lack of him there. Um, Loki, I don't know. I was I was thinking about that as a consistent theme. And I was wondering if Loki is maybe about 
because the Loki that we meet is going to be the Loki who, you know, uh, hopped a ride out of um, the Avengers uh, film and not the Loki we've seen go through all this emotional development. And I don't know if he's going to learn about all the emotional development that he went through, but I mean, that has to be a wild experience to know that there is a version of you that has lived something so different. And are you mourning something in yourself? I don't know if I just talked myself into a circle, but no, no, of course that those were all fascinating questions that I like asked myself. And I think there's a bigger question is, does he know that? Right. Does it, you know, is he, that, that was a choice to, to make is, is he aware of all that? You know, I, I think from a, from a practical standpoint, the fans of this character know that and watched him uh, experience a character arc through infinity war. Mm -hmm. Uh, And in a lot of ways, maybe even arc out, you know, it it felt like he was tiptoeing right to the edge of a reconciliation with Thor and everything. And and it's like what what you might call a, a redemption arc. I think it was, it was our responsibility to um to do something different you know to to do justice to to the character that they'd fallen in love with since thor the dark world yeah um you know that and and make sure that that loki is everybody enjoys him and and is is still there but it's ultimately it's a different the it's a different version of the character who yeah. ha- who hasn't undergone that growth yeah, we had to embrace that. Uh, and to me, that was always an opportunity um, to just to do something different. That's why our show exists. I was talking to someone much smarter than me who was just talking about how they felt like every story should be a love story, that that WandaVision is so compelling because it's a love story. And that this is at the beginning of Falcon the Winter Soldier. He was saying Falcon the Winter Soldier should be a love story about Sam and Bucky, not doesn't have to be romance romance it can just be you know this is about totally. these two characters coming together you know i think that's i think that's great i, I james ponsel who's one of my friends and, and collaborators he he said that before and it struck with me that that every story is a love story uh or or, or something like that and it and it's true and, and it's uh and that and that can be a story between a father and a son Right. Uh, Goodwill Hunting is a love story between uh, Matt Damon and Robin Williams' character. Yeah. It, it, like, uh, you know, every yeah. I so so I'm always looking for for that. Um, can I ask you about winning an Emmy and what that was like for you? Please, please. I say <laughs> it's not in here. I can go get it. I'm look at yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. No. <laughs> All, all, so much of the credit for that episode goes to Jeff Loveness, Al Lundy, the writers. Uh, I was of all the episodes of the season, I, I didn't have a ton to do with that one. I, I was I was off on Loki, but happy to ride their coattails. Uh, <laughs> I I love to have the the Emmy. It's fun to do bits with. I like to bring it to my friends' houses and and just remind them that I have one. <laughs> you so, have one, yeah. Yeah, I'm happy happy to have it. Yeah, they're not already impressed. You're writing a Star Wars or whatever, but you're like, I mean, but also, you know, I just my my mind immediately went to the the EGOT. I was like, all right, uh, Oscar. Yeah. I figure I can fi- I could figure that out. Sure. I, Tony, I write write a play, write a music. You know, mm-hmm. okay, right. So sudden suddenly, that's that's where your mind goes, and and so and then I was like, all right, who's the youngest EGOT winner? So that that that's the that's that's the Right, what's your, you know what's what, your what's your Grammy plan? Uh, the the gra- that one's gonna be tough. That I'm like I'm like maybe an audio book. Maybe that's the mm. you know that I don't mm. know how uh, scrupulous of a way to win a Grammy that is. But but that 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 or I or I write a musical that gets adapted into a movie and somehow win a grid absolutely one shot totally yeah, like tony like grammy one. oscar yeah Bing, for all Bing, you Bing. know dr strange is a musical that could be the one i would love that i would absolutely <laughs> love a musical dr strange 
Um, I can think my last question for you um, might just be in the casting of Loki. Um, yeah, I mean, that was, you know, I think Mobius was always the, uh, we knew so much was going to ride on casting that character. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, it, it's, he serves as, kind of the face of the TVA in, in a way. And as you can see from the trailers, somebody that was going to have a lot of interaction with Tom. Yeah. Um, and need to, his energy was going to have to uh, complement Loki's energy in a, in a compelling way. They had a relationship, obviously, from, from Midnight Paris. They, they'd worked together uh, on that a little bit. And, and they That's just, right. you know, they instantly uh, clicked creatively and and so uh you know what that i would say you know mobius and loki that's that's one of the love stories uh, that you might see in in loki uh for for sure although if you print that the fans are gonna like no no i won't i won't i won't put it that way don't worry um <laughs> i know we, I, our fans um but in yeah. that context i know what you mean i mean you referenced catch me if you can before and I would consider Catch Me If You Can a love story between Tom Hanks' character and Leonardo DiCaprio's character. Exactly. Exactly yeah. right. Exactly yeah. right. That makes sense. All right. Um, well, I think we did it. We I did it. it. I'm yeah. so glad we met again. Thanks, yeah. Rob. I'm glad I was interesting enough uh, that you wanted to talk to me again. All right. So this is the the back section of the podcast where where Anthony and I get to play a little a little nerdier, a little a little more detail oriented. Um, I want to start with something that Waldron said about this idea that like he wanted, you know, I was asking him, WandaVision is definitely a TV show, right? They like you can talk about singular episodes of WandaVision, like, you know, the the Dick Van Dyke show episode or the Bewitched episode or whatever. Those the, That's how WandaVision rolled out. And then with Falcon and the Winter Soldier, they were saying like, oh, this is a six hour movie. We're making a six hour movie. I really could not pluck out a single episode of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, like the one where Zemo shows up i guess i don't know you know it's a little muddier right uh so i asked wondering like are you making a film here are you making a tv show and he's like oh, definitely a tv show mm. this is definitely a show where it's like the one where loki x <laughs> um and I, I i was just wondering like uh what you think about that about like marvel approaching their disney plus opportunity as like a tv versus film long form well film. i do think you have to consider that it's you're telling a story in chapters and people may binge it, but um, the way a story feels when it's stretched out over um, numerous sections can be different. You know, you need to have some beats there and some satisfaction and resolution each time. In addition to the generation of new drama and new tension and new things that keep you coming back the next time. So it's a different form you know in some ways you could think of the what is what's it called the infinity cycle that saga? whole yeah well I, th I thought he called it a cycle oh well oh, okay. maybe the infinity sure. saga yeah uh but it is kind of a cycle right where you've got the three um phases that all comprise one big overarching story so you could see them each as like two two and a half hour uh episodes of tv <laughs> uh each of them building up to it i think like what makes them distinct like what makes these segments distinct will be interesting i'm not sure obviously neither of us have seen those episodes yet but wandavision you know had the had the means of saying this is the 60s episode this is the 70s episode this is the 80s episode this is the flashback episode um this is the very special episode uh, it, it had a means it had a, a little cadence to it so I'm curious what that cadence will be. I mean, possibly one thing could be like the one with Kid Loki, the one mm -hmm. with Richard E. Grant Loki, the one with, uh, you know, uh, Loki for President Loki from the trailer. You know what I mean? Like D.B. Mm -hmm. Cooper Loki, like all this sort of stuff. So like that, that was sort of my thought was that maybe it'll be flavored by the other Lokis that he encounters. Yeah. And, you know, that will be that. We'll get to Liddy Loki in a second. Um, uh. And that maybe even the font, you know, I was thinking about, you know how the font, the logo is like four different uh, mm -hmm. fonts and then it sort of uh, sort of ratchets through 
uh, as you know, if you watch one of the trailers, it'll like ratchet through the different fonts on the different letters. And I was thinking like, what if each episode, ha- it, like you see the Loki logo and it will like look, it'll be all unified one Loki. That's just a guess. But like, this is the one where all the Loki letters are green or are all mm-hmm. made of wood or are all gold or like whatever it is. I don't know. Just a thought. Um, all right. So let's let's run through some of the inspirations that Waldron mentioned. Some surprising fun inspirations here. Uh, catch me if you can. Uh, yeah. The great Leonardo DiCaprio, Tom Hanks, Steven Spielberg film. Well, one of my favorite films, actually, uh, which is about a, a, a con man as played by uh, DiCaprio uh, chased a charming, the world. a charming scoff law <laughs> chased around the world by, uh, you know, a, a cap, a cop in the form of Tom Hanks. Uh, and, uh, you know, I could see. Loki and Mobius sort of slotting into this. What do you think? How do you feel about that? Uh, yeah, I could see that. That's a good comp. Like, you know, what's what's interesting is, uh, again, the character uh, Frank W. Abagnale from Catch Me If You Can. We liked him and we were kind of rooting for him in the same way that we do with Loki. Like, he's bad, but it's fun. It's fun to break the rules. And even though you know you shouldn't, he shouldn't, or that he's doing wrong. It's oh, like kind of there's just an a, a appeal there. Yeah, uh, you're you're rooting for DiCaprio, not for the Tom Hanks FBI agent. Uh, he's well, you're kind, kind of, of rooting for them both, I think, in that movie. And I think that's what makes that movie so beautiful. Is like the one of the best parts of that movie is like the Christmas phone call that they have, where it's this yeah. just sort of like beautiful moment between these two characters, where like t- Tom Hanks's character is almost rooting for leo as well <laughs> you know what i mean like a little it's, bit it's, it, yeah it's like a father-son relationship yeah like, exactly like, you exactly. know dicaprio didn't have that his father taught him to be a scammer and uh yeah you know tom hanks is like the steady force the steadiness that grounds you and so maybe that's what we're going to get here but i, I kind of don't see that because i don't think that um that's the relationship these guys would have struck up it seems a little more like Almost like overbearing big brother and troublemaking younger brother. <laughs> like like you, you know, a uh, Cain and Abel type situation. One guy goes good, the other goes bad. And uh, the tension between with, them. With, with the Mobius character? Yeah, what do you think? Uh, maybe, yeah. I, I, to me, he just looks like sort of a, a wry, uh, which Owen Wilson character isn't wry, but like a wry kind of fatigued bureaucrat who yeah. thinks that Loki might be able to help him. But I don't think of it as like a big, I mean, if I, if you say Cain and Abel, I would think Thor and Loki, you know what I mean? It's a different sort of relationship. Yeah, but Thor, that's the thing is that Thor, Thor just doesn't have much interest in Loki unless he's bad. You know what I mean? When Loki's behaving, Thor doesn't pay attention to him. So, <laughs> so this is like, point. <laughs> this is like this sibling relationship where it's like, come on, you can, you can do this. Get your, clean up your apartment and pay your rent. And like, you know, get the boot off of your car that's parked illegally on the street. And like, come on, you can walk the straight and narrow. Like, I need your help. And, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm like a Mycroft Holmes and Sherlock situation. Like, mm. you know, get yourself <laughs> together. Yes, you have all these powers, but like, you know, I'm the steady one. You know, the straight man. Uh, Abbott to his Costello. Let's say. <laughs> maybe, I know I'm maybe. throwing out a lot of disparate you're just throwing parents, out really but... fresh new comparisons like Abbott and Costello. No, I love I love mm. it. Um all right, let's talk about let's talk about Blade Runner as an inspiration here. I'm I'm having yeah. trouble laying Blade Runner over this. What do you um what do you think? Maybe well, it's like uh, maybe it's because it's like replicant hunting a replicant sort of thing. Yeah, I don't know. Keeping keeping things in order, but then do you really want like the thing I the thing I'm presuming here is that you know Decker in uh, Blade Runner, like, I don't know, he starts to realize, like, I'm destroying these replicants, but they do feel things. Like, they are human in some way, so am I the bad guy, you know? And I think yeah. if the point of the show is to catch and kill these offshoots of Loki, you know, maybe at some point he's going to be like, well, you know, why can't we just let them be? You know, that was the tension in Blade Runner. Maybe, maybe we could just let this happen. Uh, and we don't have to tie it off, you know? Is he that... brought up... Yeah, uh, no, I like it. 
he yeah i can i can see a tears in the rain sort of moment uh mm-hmm. could possibly be coming here um he mentioned in glorious he mentioned the uh, tarantino films and glorious bastards specifically um and in in that reference he was talking about uh because i was asking him, i was like okay are we gonna get like zany rick and morty like hopping through time hopping through worlds uh sometimes you know many in the span of one episode and he was like no <laughs> It was like we're we're gonna get some Rick and Morty esque stuff, but what we're getting is uh uh and 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 tell me if you think I'm excited about this, uh Anthony. L- he wants us to luxuriate in long scenes of dialogue and tension building. That sounds like the Joanna re- recipe for what makes uh, a good Marvel movie or series. catnip. Catnip mm-hmm. to me. I'm excited. So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm just thinking about like the the tavern scene in Glorious Bastards, one of the greatest uh, film scenes of all time, uh, you know, with with Fassbender and uh, etc. Um, Mad Men, uh, which we've already talked about a little bit, uh, we'll get to DB Cooper in a second, but that's a that's a Mad Men adjacent thing. But I think just that that journey of Don Draper is something that he's kind of interested in. He mentioned the leftovers. Uh, he mentioned the line. Uh, did you watch the leftovers, Anthony? I have not. I've read the book though. Oh, okay. but, but great! I know they diverge. Yeah, season three of the Leftovers has this wild episode, uh, which is, I think it's called "It's a Matt, 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 Matt World," uh, where uh, a character played by Christopher Eccleston, uh, Matt, goes on a boat ride, and there's this like lion sex cult on the boat. It's a wild episode of television, brilliant. And he was like, "That's the flavor I'm going for: the lion sex cult episode of Leftovers." So, if you're a Leftovers fan, get excited about that. Uh, and then lastly, uh, and this is this is sort of going to lead me uh, into my next thing, but he said before sunrise. What does before sunrise mean to you, Anthony Breskin? They meet. They meet cute. And it's just like about having this day of infatuation and it's going to end. You're going to you're going to sundown and that's going to be it. And, um, you know, obviously it goes on a little further than that. But it, in the first one, it doesn't part way. So I think it's about the temporariness of things and knowing they're not going to last and enjoying them while they do. That's what and, before sunrise yeah. meant to me. Um, and one, and, and it's such a talky film. It's just the two of them talking, walking and talking the whole film. Right. Mm-hmm. So that brings me to my next point, <laughs> which is back to lady Loki, uh, who I think is the female lead of the show. They're hiding her in the trailers, but I'm pretty sure lady Loki is. And I think she's the antagonist as well. Um, I think she's the most evil, chaotic Loki, and that he is being sent. I once again, I have not seen an episode, so I don't know. But just based on Waldron, what Waldron was saying, I'm like, okay, what if? What if? Let's play a what if game. What if Lady Loki is the antagonist of the show, the the chief mischief maker, and the TVA is like track her down, kill her, stop her. We need you, Loki, to do that. But who is Loki most likely to fall in love with? If not yeah. himself, right? Well, it's such a, it's a, you know, if we're going to go back to myths, it's uh, not a Norse myth, but Narcissus. And, mm-hmm. you know, staring into your own reflection. And the fact that she's the worst of the worst also would be, talk about catnip for Loki. Like, he, like he, I could see him definitely being uh, enchanted by that. Ooh, she's think... even meaner and <laughs> more crazy than I am. Yeah, he's going to admire her, I think. Uh, Mm -hmm. And um, so my question is, you know, like, I was trying to figure out, like, what could be sort of the stake? Like, what could the TVA do to convince Loki to work for them? Like, one thing is, like, uh, you your survival depends on it. That's one option, right? Um, Another option is, like, they there's scenes in the trailer of Mobius sort of showing Loki his life. And it's not just his life before he stepped out of Avengers, because there's some Ragnarok stuff in there, too. So, like his his mother's death hasn't happened uh in his version of time uh mm. yet and that is one of the uh, like big big wounds for loki is freya's death in thor the dark world um so i'm wondering if you know if he's if he's working a second agenda if he's trying to figure out how to save his mom like you know that's all that that's just stuff that i think is integral to loki that i think might be interesting in the show but i, I Whatever's happening, whatever, whatever, whoever he's, he's hunting, whatever he's doing, I can only imagine that whatever he says, whatever he tells, he's tells the TVA that he's doing, he probably has another agenda running because he's Loki, right? That would be my guess. 
I don't know. Mm -hmm. Look out for the hidden Loki agenda at all times. You know, have you ever seen the Albert Brooks movie um, with Meryl Streep called uh, Defending Your Life? Defending Your Life. Yeah, yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. This sounds a little bit like that, where he dies, and then he goes to this bureaucracy, and they essentially analyze you. It's almost like a little bit of a court hearing, but it's not a criminal court hearing. It's more like a custody hearing or something, where a tribunal looks at your life, and you can you have an advocate. He has Rip Torn as his like supernatural <laughs> lawyer, and mm-hmm. and again, it strikes me as like that whole like you're not quite human, but you're this other being, but you look like a human that uh, that our TVA uh, employees are. And, you know, you've got to essentially prove that your life uh, was meaningful enough that you get to move on to the next level and that existence and the soul continues this journey into infinity, leveling up every time. And so if you're not, if you, if you just led a shabby life, you go back and you're reincarnated <laughs> and you can go to the past lives pavilion and check out your existence. And I feel like a little bit of this show, the way we're hearing it described, brings that up. The bureaucracy, mm-hmm. the supernatural, fused with the supernatural, the notion mm-hmm. of like, this is your life a little bit, uh, stepping out and examining the whole thing from beginning to end and how you lived it. So I, I, I gather he didn't cite that as a, as a reference, but it sounds a little bit like that to me. No, I, I think that's a great that's a great reference to note. Um, a great film to watch too. Um, the nice thing about Albert Brooks is he has not become problematic, and so we can still enjoy his movies. <laughs> Though some of his movies, but like modern, I tried to watch mod, is it Modern Romance? I think Modern. Anyway, hmm. I tried to watch an Albert Brooks movie on the Criterion Channel recently, and I was like, "Ooh, this is no, this is a no for me." Oh, I love I, I love one? a lot of Robert Bro- Albert Brooks, but some of it is not aged super well. Anyway, um, one thing that I. I'm going to continue to try to wrap my head around is the fact that Waldron cited Steve Jobs as sort of someone that he connected to Loki. <laughs> he was like, they were both orphans. They both like control. I don't know. I'm I'm going to, I'm going to think about that one a little, a little longer. He, the other, Dis- the other uh, reference he made. Disruptors that, uh, of some sort. Uh, that I hope you'll like is he likened uh, Dr. Strange to Anthony Bourdain. Uh, which I thought was really interesting. So that's like that's a little peek into his take on Strange for the new Strange film. So, uh, but yeah, Steve Jobs. Let's let's just continue to think about that uh, as we go forward. Hmm. All right, we're at the TVA. <laughs> we're talking about time travel. Let's talk about uh, how this show could possibly affect things going forward. We got an email from from a, a, a listener who said that they weren't really fond about the way in which. Uh, these shows have to sort of heavily lift other uh, Marvel properties that WandaVision becomes like a prequel for Doctor Strange or uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, that is, I think what these shows will always continue to do. And I think hopefully they will only get more graceful with that. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Kang the Conqueror. Is there anything you can tell me about Kang the Conqueror, Anthony Brasnikan? Well, we get another um, connection here to Lovecraft Country. Um, so with Jonathan Majors, he's been cast as that part mm-hmm. in the uh, Ant-Man film, I believe, right? Mm-hmm. Quantum Mania. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he's a big bad in the Marvel Universe, one of the biggest bads there is, and interesting casting, like compelling casting, because I think Jonathan... Majors is such a, uh, a like a likable and and like can you connect with him as a performer, like you root for him. So to cast him as the villain, that's that's like again, it's like just casting a leading man as a as the bad guy. That's an interesting choice. So um, I'm c- kind of compelled to see, uh, or I'm curious to see how exactly they do this. So the other thing about Kang the Conqueror is. He is known as a Nexus being in Marvel lore, and the Nexus is what was opened up in WandaVision, uh, you know, in, and she dreamed about it or in one of those, uh, one of those commercials right. that, that were in the series. And the Nexus, of course, is just like infinite doors to different realities. And so Kang is one of the people who can traverse this, as is Wanda Maximoff. Uh, and a number of other characters, and these are characters who, I, be- I believe I'm describing this right, exist in every timeline. That in some, you go into some timelines, and 
Anthony and Joanna don't exist there, but we're in <laughs> others. But uh, Nexus beings exist in every single timeline. They are consistent throughout that. Every I think they're also door you the open. Same. I think they're also, I could be wrong, but I think they're also the same in every timeline. So you wouldn't get a Lady Kang, right? Yeah. Like that, that yes. like the time branches could give you different flavors of Loki, but Kang and Wanda would be eternally Kang and Wanda and all these different branches. Yes. They're the thread the that thing. runs through all of right. that. And so right. it's the same thread. And that's what makes them unique, and but also very powerful and also very rare. So the reason we're talking about Kang here uh, in in Loki is um, Kang is 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 a is a well known time traveler, <laughs> a, a breaker of continuity, um, and a, a, a foe of the TVA in the comics. Um, there are some theories that he might actually be one of the like time. Oh, I don't know what they're called. Time something uh in 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 the tva there's these three statues that time you see cops the <laughs> <laughs> these three statues in the three these basically the founders of the tva these mm. three statues these three faces uh that you see sort of a couple different times a couple different places and in the comics there are these like three founders of the tva or whatever um kang is not one of them in the comics but uh some folks have noticed that the card features of one of the statues um Bears are resembled to Jonathan Major's handsome visage. So it is possible that Kang is somehow involved. I'm not saying Jonathan Major is going to show up, but like that Kang is somehow involved. And the other connection, the big connection, uh, is that Gugu Mbatha Ra's character, Ravona Renslayer, uh, that's the name of Kang's like great love in the comics. Mm. Um, that he, you know, traveled through time and space and whatever to make it work with this woman. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, I Google about the Ron Jonathan majors. Yes, please give it to me. I would love that. So, um, that might be a connection that we see sort of springing forward Ant-Man and something that Waldron talked about is because Jeff Loveness, his, his former Rick and Morty, uh, co-writer, uh, was working on Ant-Man. They were sort of in conversation as they developed these things, they were talking because they're friends, right? They're both friends who get hired by Marvel from the same show around the same time. Of course, you're going to be talking and being like, oh, my God, did they tell you that? Did they ask you to do that? You know, and sort of like there's sort of there's a bit of a spirit of of. Um, and I think Jeff t t told me that that Waldron helped him on his Ant-Man pitch. So there's just a spirit of collaboration there. Um, the other spirit of collaboration that Waldron told me is that he, he, when he was developing, when he was working on Loki, he was right next to the WandaVision writer's room in the Marvel offices. He became really good friends with Jack Schaefer, who was the head writer of WandaVision. And so, uh, as he pops forward to Dr. Strange too, he was like, I'm picking, I'm scooping up Wanda from Jack and running forward with Wanda. And I have this like personal stakes in this because i don't want to disappoint my friend <laughs> with what she set up with wanda maximoff so i'm just scooping her up and taking her into dr strange mm. and i thought that was really interesting i like that uh, friendly rivalries can be such a good thing productive <laughs> for creative but also like or friendly collaboration you know what i mean and mm -hmm. um Something that he said, Waldron said in the interview, is he's like, something about, well, Marvel handing the ball off, right? Like, because he was talking about how they talk about time travel in Endgame and how they mm -hmm. have to take that that conception of time travel in Endgame into consideration as they consider time travel in this show, right? Um, but he was talking about how, like, <laughs> you create a disaster in in Loki, and we'll leave that for the next writers. But then... Uh, you go from Loki to writing Doctor Strange, and you have to clean up your own mess. Is what he said. So, like, there's definitely like a through line of like whatever's happening with time branching and reality branching in Loki is going to feed directly into Doctor Strange too. But the good news is, it's the same writer <laughs> on both things. So, hopefully, there will be a lot of connective tissue there. So mm -hmm. that's the thing. All right, last uh, forward-looking thing. What are we always on the lookout for Anthony Bresnikin in these Disney Plus shows? Uh, it is the youth, the kids. Um, the next generation. The next generation. We've been talking about the Young Avengers nonstop. Mm -hmm. Who are some of the other Young Avengers that we've talked about, Res? Yeah, some of the Young Avengers that we've already seen uh, turned up in WandaVision. Uh, her children, her two sons, uh, who vanished... I don't know where, into the Nexus. They just disappeared. They were taken away and need to be rescued. They're two important uh, key members of the Young Avengers, Wiccan and Speed. Uh, we also saw Eli Bradley, who was um, 
Isaiah Bradley's grandson in The Falcon and Winter Soldier. Didn't get a lot of screen time, but uh, that's a character who steps up and takes on a Captain America-ish sounding name of uh, the Patriot. And um, yeah, so then Kid Loki also gets in on the action, right? So that's where we might see a little bit of this. Yeah, so if if there's a if there's a young actor playing a Kid Loki in this show that seems really fun and you might want to see him again, you might see him in some big Young Avengers team up. Like we said, we don't know. It's not been announced, but they really are seeding all of these characters into the Disney Plus shows. And, it's, you, you know, can't ignore it. And there's another one that's coming up, Kate Bishop in Hawkeye. Yeah. Uh, she, you know, fights under the name Hawkeye. She becomes, assumes the mantle of Hawkeye. We've talked about that phenomenon happening a lot in the Marvel uh, universe. And Haley Steinfeld is playing her in the upcoming Hawkeye series. Correct. So, you know, and, and Merrick Chavez, Miss Marvel, you know, like there's all sorts of options coming mm -hmm. up. So, uh, you know, just keep your eye on the youth of Disney+. Plus. Um, all right. Uh, last thing I'll say is that I believe Loki's going to show up in Thor Love and Thunder. So, you know, that's another thing to a branch to look for. But those are our branches and they all seem like things that could could happen a little bit more organically than maybe some of the stuff we saw happen elsewhere. And I'm only I'm just hoping that Marvel will continue to learn to make this feel part more deftly part of a bigger tapestry than, uh, you know, I think I think the worst example in the films is Ultron, which has some super clunky lifts to offshoots like Ragnarok, you know, like all the Thor stuff in Ultron is pretty clunky and stuff like that, right? So I just think, but but then eventually I think they get a little bit more graceful and I'm hoping they'll get more graceful with the TV shows as well. Last thing I want to talk about, which is just like some fun, fun little minutia stuff from the trailer stuff to get excited for. This is a time heisty kind of time hoppy Doctor who -y kind of show, which means we're going to be like hopping around in time. There's this big elevator in the trailers that appears to be like, how they portal through time, which mm -hmm. is very, very Doctor Who TARDIS, very Bill and Ted phone booth sort of thing. Um, and then we've seen some some things. We've seen uh, D.B. Cooper, which is a 1971 uh, real life unsolved mystery, uh, which was referenced in Mad Men. Um, like a lot of people thought John Draper was yeah. D.B. Cooper or whatever. Yeah. Um, so D.B. Cooper like yeah. uh, staged a heist on an airplane, took yeah. a bunch of cash, jumped out yeah. of the airplane, was never seen or heard from again. So people don't know, yeah. did he die? What happened to the money? Did he survive yeah. and make it out? Uh, big mystery. And in the trailer, like Loki is D.B. Cooper. And as he hops out of the plane, he gets like zapped out of the sky by the rainbow bridge. Like Heimdall, like saps him out of the sky that's what happened to db cooper it's it's it was loki like that's that's the fun answer there we also see him in the it trailer was agatha all along <laughs> exactly <laughs> and like we see him in the trailer in pompeii and there's this cool like Seder square mystery of pompeii that you can look up that i imagine will be like i think they're gonna just pop him into like various historical unsolved mysteries uh you know we you, get robert you stack Earhart, turning up at like a <laughs> i don't know you know like it's just gonna be i think they're just gonna have a lot of fun in the, uh, in the 80s, he will keep uh, Robert Stack gainfully employed on his hit NBC <laughs> show, Unsolved Mysteries. Unsolved Mysteries. It was Loki all along. Um, yeah, the, uh, the, the last thing I'll say is something you might have seen in the trailer is this branching timeline image, uh, which is in the most recent trailer. And uh, when I asked uh, Waldron, you guys will have heard it, but I will just like confirm. Uh, when I asked Waldron... You know, I've asked all these head writers sort of like what was posted up in their writer's room. <laughs> and Malcolm Spellman said, uh, you know, it was the speech from the end of Black Panther, right? Killmonger's speech. Um, for Waldron, it was these branching timeline images. And he was like, we were constantly looking at them, interrogating them, uh, trying to play the Reddit nerds ourselves, essentially, so that no one would be able to catch us out <laughs> in an inconsistency week to week. So uh, Waldron is aware that we will be uh, analyzing this time travel show to death week to week. So uh, he has done his best to keep ah. it consistent for all of us. We shall and see. nobody who makes anything that has to do with time travel ever steps out of line. <laughs> That's the <laughs> toughest thing. <laughs> Just like built in like, with paradoxes. <laughs> totally. He was like, I'm so jealous of the Endgame writers, basically, right? Because they, they got to do time travel. But then, like, you walk out of Endgame and, like, the number one thing you're focusing on is not going to be the time travel paradox. Eventually, we got there. A lot of people 
like to talk about the time travel paradox of of Avengers Endgame, but like mostly you walk out, you're like, oh, you know, Natasha and Tony, you know, you know, like you're filled with a lot of other stuff. And then once your brain starts cooking, and he was like, we won't have that. It'll be week to week cooking brains, looking at our time travel. So uh, that's what we'll be doing here on the Still Watching podcast, where you can email us your uh, nitpicks with the time travel logic, Still Watching Pod yeah. at gmail dot com, uh, and anything else you might want to send over. And we'll cook your brain. Uh, it sounds good. Uh, Anthony Bresnikin, is there anything else uh, we want to say before we head out? I'm just dying to watch it. I think let's... It's exciting, right? It's going to be really fun, yeah. I think. So uh, yeah. I'm, I'm thrilled. Uh, so that, that is our Loki preview. Uh, we will be back next week with Richard Lawson. Uh, with, I believe, Tom Hiddleston himself also uh, on this podcast on, on Thursday mm, next week. Making and promises. Big to- promises. <laughs> I don't usually like to promise, but I'm pretty sure that one's in the bag. That's a good so one. Tom Hiddleston talk about it, episode one of Loki next week. Uh, and if not, y'all can email me at Still Watching Pod for uh, breaking my promise to you. Anthony Bresnikan, until then, where can folks find you? You can find me on VanityFair.com and my personal blog, 101 Ways to Cook a Brain. <laughs> dot net. <laughs> uh, you can also. It's, it's kind of recipes and, you know, philosophy. <laughs> Kind of uh, you can also find me rewatching episodes of Abbott and Costello uh, to try to make sure I understand all of Anthony's references. Uh, Crying Tears in the Rain. Also Abbott, by me. Abbott was the straight man. <laughs> Costello was the wild card. <laughs> you can find me on VanityFair.com or you can follow me on Twitter at Joe Wrote This and we will see you all next week. Bye. Bye.